In 2010, everybody thought that the war had been won and uh, it was over. It was just small pockets of resistance. But when you looked at the data and it was analyzed and a totally different picture emerged that actually had gone from bad to worse. You must remember that the attack on Iraq, although presented as a war, was not a war. It was so one-sided uh, and it became an attack on the civilian population. The most vivid and probably the most educative revelation was collateral murder. Light them all up. Come on, fire! The collateral murder has had a wide impact. Uh, it has changed the perspective of the war. It woke people up to the horror of this uh, illegal invasion and the war and the aftermath of it. It was very important to actually go to the scene and actually do investigative work on the scene in this uh, instance because there were l lack of clarity from just observing the video who these individuals were and we wanted to know get to know, to know the names, to understand the circumstances of, of how on earth you had, had wounded children being taken out from underneath basically the dead father who was, well, in my terms, assassinated. It was important to go to Baghdad uh, so you can get a, an untainted evidence and, and witness testament. And that's what we did. Uh, we brought their, we got death certificates and, uh, and other evidences pertaining to the incident and of course uh, uh, the compelling uh, testimony from the individuals who uh, all told the same story. This is Bushman 7, go ahead. Roger, we have a black SUV or a bongo truck picking up the bodies. Fuck. Request permission to engage. This is Bushmaster 7, Roger. This is Bushmaster 7, Roger, engage. 1-8, engage. Clear. Come on. In this instance, Clear. you are obviously going after unarmed civilians who are actually on a rescue mission to save somebody who is wounded. So it's an obvious war crime and uh, it's uh, shocking to m maintain that this is uh, within the frame of rules of engagement uh, of the US military. It's important to understand the, uh, the asymmetry of the situation there, that you have a, even a silent helicopter so high up in the sky it's not visible. The cannon on the Apache helicopter is, uh, is equipped with uh, large hollow bullets. So the effect when the uh, bullet hits the, uh, its objective is that it explodes like a small hand grenade. It's designed basically to uh, be used against armored vehicles and tanks because it can penetrate steel. And to use that against uh, uh, humans on the ground is just uh, outrageous in itself. Oh yeah, look at that, right through the windshield. <laughs> when I was on the ground there in Baghdad and meeting a group of uh, relatives of those who were killed on that, uh, that square that day, among the crowd an old man came forth and said, uh, I mean, they, they bombed my house. Uh, what can be seen in that part of the video is that two men, obviously with uh, AK rifles on the back, go into a house and it's decided to basically or liberate the house with a, a, a Hellfire missile. This hotel two six over. Roger, have another individual with a weapon. Assailant in the same building. Hey, Roger that. Just ensure. Before they uh, pull the the trigger, the uh, an innocent bystander or a, a man just walking past. There's a market nearby. Is seen walking straight into the crosshair and the path of the Hellfire missile. Despite seeing this clearly on the screen, they shoot. This is a residential neighborhood. When you walk through this neighborhood, you can see laundry hang hanging from the 
uh, the lines, uh, people going about their daily lives trying to adapt to a, a very difficult situation in a war zone, but people try to retain a level of normality. <laughs> رأسا البوب كلها يوم كيف بابا شو دخل علينا دخان أبيض وبدينا ما نسمع يعني البنات يصرخ ما حد يسمع اللاغ عشان يعني بس لحد يعني حس كأنه لحد الآن أكو أصيص بذاني ما أسمع نهائيا وبرخ خمس دقائق أخرى أو لحظات الصاروخ الثاني بعد نهائيا ما حس يعني. والصاروخ الثالث يعني احس البنايه كانها يعني رجع ارضيه يعني بالضبط رجع ارضيه اي بعدين ما يعني جو الناس قتلة بالشارع وبالبناية ستة وبزوجته وياهم بعد ما حسيت يعني 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 فشي فظيع مين ما يعني ما بساعة اللحظة والله ما ما توصف يعني. Five families were basically living in this house that he owned. It's another example how there is no total disregard for those who are nearby. Uh, just to get these two guys, you have two men, uh, the, you, you, are, you, are, you are ready to down and, uh, and kill everybody inside. Oh yeah, look at those dead bastards. Nice. And I remember when I <clears throat> first met Julian, he said that, that to him and to others, it was that word nice that turned the stomach. Uh, that told you so much. In other words, it was murder. Well, in this incident, the cholera murder incident, that there, there is uh, no mention of any civilians. Uh, everybody is, uh, is categorized as uh, enemy combatant. It is to, uh, uh, to lower the numbers of, of what they call collateral damage, which is a, rather a, a, an awkward term for, for killed civilians. Welcome to this Don't Extradite Assange broadcast. My name's John Rees. I work for the Don't Extradite Assange campaign here in London. And we've got a terrific panel of people here today to discuss the impact of the collateral murder video. There's been a double page spread in The Guardian earlier this week, and that was uh, revealing the thoughts of one of our guests, Dean Yates, who was the Reuters bureau chief in uh, Baghdad when that uh, video was uh, released. And we'll be talking to Dean later. But first, I want to come to Kristen Hoffordson, who's the editor-in-chief of WikiLeaks, and he's going to give us some of the background to the collateral murder video and uh, the impact that it had when it was released by WikiLeaks. Uh, Kristen. Thank you, John. Uh, yes, it uh, seems like it happened yesterday, although it's been 10 years, uh, when Julian Assange showed me that uh, video on a cafe in Reykjavik a few years, a few weeks before it was released on April 10th, uh, 2010. Uh, I was a broadcasting journalist at the time for the Icelandic State Television, and I uh, instantly uh, suggested that we should cooperate, that uh, the State TV should become a media partner in that project. I was stunned seeing, seeing the imagery. Uh, it was on silent. We were sitting at a cafe. I didn't hear anything, but I, what, I, what flicked over the screen just stunned me, and I saw instantly that this was of historic importance. I had been to Baghdad a, a couple of times before, and I had seen images from uh, uh, conflict videos, uh, but uh, all the other ones that I've seen were of much lower grade, uh, which lets me to believe that the US military, when they released something like that, uh, downgraded uh, the uh, videos uh, to hide and obfuscate the fact uh, of their uh, superiority. Now I got a copy of that video and I, I watched it hundreds of times and then of course the audio came in and it became just worse and, and worse. I studied it frame by frame and uh, I was quite shocked to what I had seen and heard, especially the discussion between the crew members when they opened fire 
uh, and uh, are complimenting each other on their achievement, saying things like, uh, look at all these dead bastards, and you have a uh, reply, nice. To this day, when I hear the word nice, it actually uh, reflects me back to that video. It almost destroyed that word. And uh, the, uh, the killing of, of, of Said Sma, who is, who is uh, wounded in the original attack, uh, is, is, of course, of outrageous concern. You, you see them, the helicopter video, helicopter crew having him in, a, in his, the crosshairs and suddenly realizing that they have to play by some rule books and they decided that they couldn't open fire on these wounded unarmed men, but they are pleading for him to reach out to a gun. All you gotta do is pick up a weapon. They so wanted to kill him. Uh, and then of course you had the minivan coming to the scene uh, with uh, the driver Mataster, uh, Tomal and his two children and two of his friends that he had been giving a lift and uh, attempting to help uh, uh, Said. Sma and uh, they decided and plead to uh, get permission to open fire and, and basically obliterate that minivan or bongo truck. That one, that incident is a, is a clear example of a murder and uh, but no one has been held accountable for that. Now the effect of this uh, release uh, has been uh, tremendous. I think that uh, it will forever define the way we see the Iraq war, the uh, uh, callousness and the total disregard for civilians uh, in, in that uh, conflict zone. And when I traveled to Baghdad prior to the release, I, it struck me um, that I hadn't thought of, of, of actually the fact that this is a residential neighborhood, uh, Al Amin in Southeast Baghdad. It's just a residential neighborhood where people are trying under difficult, difficult circumstances to go about their uh, normal daily life. Uh, it was only war zone for the US military. For them, it was their neighborhood, their home. Now, I think uh, this video uh, had a, a lasting impact and will do so. Uh, the lies that we're uh, giving out, which I'm sure Dean will talk about later, uh, were, of course, uh, uh, revealed. Uh, the day after the incident on 12th of July in 2007, the US military gave out a statement and made no mention of civilians except uh, the two Reuters journalists who were killed, Namir Noor al Din and Said Sma. There is no mention of the other civilians, uh, uh, Matasha Tomal and his two neighbors. And of course, there is no mention of the two children. Uh, they were all, they are all accepted the two Reuters uh, uh, journalists were called uh, enemy combatants. Now this has uh, changed the way we see the Iraq war and will forever be there. It has had political impact as well. Uh, it is one of the reasons uh, I am certain that the Iraqi government later decided that would, they would not give impunity to all US soldiers in Iraq which ultimately led to the uh, uh, removal of uh, the, uh, the US troops from Iraq. So it, it has changed our perspective and uh, will uh, do so in the future, John. Kristen, thank you very, very much uh, for, for that. Um, Dean Yates um, was the subject of that uh, article in the um, in the Guardian that I that I mentioned. Dean, uh, congratulations on on stepping forward and making that uh, publicity uh, happen. Of course, uh, we all understand that uh, the um, video, when you see it, is a uh, is a, a devastating thing to watch. It must have been um, more so for you because it was your staff that were involved in it as uh, bureau chief. Uh, in uh, Baghdad for uh, Reuters. Uh, j just tell us a, a little bit about uh, how you saw that and, uh, and, what it, and what it's made you think about those events since. Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, so I was actually first shown um, the first sort of three minutes of that video about uh, two weeks after Namir and Said were killed in an off-the-record briefing by two uh, US generals in the green zone in Baghdad. Um, we, we had been demanding uh, that the US obviously uh, investigate this, uh, this attack. And up to that point, um, it had been our, our view, 
certainly for our witnesses have been telling us that there was no firefight taking place when Namir and Sayed had been killed. And so I went with a with uh, my boss at the time into the green zone and um, two US generals gave us a sort of a briefing, if you like, that's strictly off the record, which meant that we could not report what we were told. And uh, we were told that um, we were given a, a sense of what had been happening. We were shown photographs. Uh, we were shown uh, other materials. And then right at the end, we were shown three minutes of this video and the tape was stopped right at the moment the helicopter was opening fire the first time. And it was just, for me, it was shock at seeing the moment that my staff were, were being killed, basically. Hadn't, this was, I had no idea that this was going to be shown to me. And uh, I went away from that briefing and for years I had this image in my head of this, yeah, I just could not get this out of my mind. And then um, Reuters tried very hard to get that tape, uh, made repeated efforts to get that tape from the Pentagon because we, we, we asked the generals for it, they wouldn't give it to us. They said you had to go through Freedom of Information Request, the Freedom of Information Act to get the tape. And they refused, they stalled Stonewall basically. And, um, and so, uh, but because the briefing was off the record, we couldn't report it. And we decided that uh, we would stick by that agreement, even though a year later on the first anniversary of Namir and Said's death, I actually proposed breaking that agreement because I felt enough time had lapsed. And, but my editors said, no, we have to abide by the, the agreement we made with the US military. And I said, fine. Um, and then fast forward to April 5th and uh, Julian releases the tape. Uh, I was actually in Tasmania where I am now, where I live. I was up in a national park here in Tasmania with my family. We were, we were up just hiking, no comms whatsoever, no phone, no communications access. I didn't even know about the video until April 7th, two days later. And when I, we came down out of this national park and there it was all in a big newspaper article. And at first I just could not get my head around, was this the same video that I was shown a small portion of? Was this? Was Sayed still alive? Was he trying to get up? Was he wounded? And and was this was this the this attack on the minivan? And it, it all just it was all just uh, very very hard for me to comprehend. And when it finally when I, when my brain finally processed what was going on, I realised that they had cheated us. That uh, as as the the bureau chief of Reuters, I had dealt with the US military in good faith. I'd, um, I felt that we had, as, as foreign journalists, as foreign media in Iraq, we had worked after this, after this attack, we had tried to work very hard with the US military to make it safer for journalists in Iraq, for the foreign media. And I, I organized meetings with the US military and foreign media so that this sort of thing wouldn't happen again. And all the time that was going on, they were sitting on this video. And to me, it just showed this obsession with secrecy. And when the tape was released by Julian, I just, I just, the deceit of that, to sit with us and talk about journalist safety to our faces in Baghdad and at the same time be sitting on this tape, where's the honor in that? And personally, for me, I really, uh, it, it, it affected me mentally very deeply. Uh, the, whole, the whole thing affected me mentally. Uh, two of my staff were killed on my watch. I held myself responsible in, in various ways. I, for not speaking up at the time when the video was released, for not speaking up about the, my organization's response at the time, Reuters was not, was not good enough, it wasn't strong enough. And I became suicidal in 2016 as a result of all this. Uh, I was admitted to a psychiatric ward two weeks later. I've had three admissions to a psych ward since. Uh, and it's taken, it's taken me a long time to, to work through this and make peace with Namir and Said and with myself. Now's the time to speak up. Dean, thank you very, very much for sharing that uh, with us. And uh, I, I think you should be assured that uh, your testimony is adding materially to the, uh, to the case uh, for freeing Julian and to our understanding of how the military operates.
operates in a occupation of a of another country. So um, please accept our thanks for participating uh, today and for, and for the work you're doing. Um, just to say that there's thousands of, of people watching this broadcast. Um, welcome to you all. Just to let you know if you want to ask questions to the panel, which I'm sure many of you will, uh, there's a Q&A function and a chat function on Zoom if that's how you're watching. And if you're watching on other platforms, please do feel free to use the comments section to ask questions. Our tech team are watching those platforms and will feed them through uh, to me so that I can get at least some of them over to our, our guests in the course of, uh, of the hour. But moving on, uh, uh, Jen Robinson has been the legal uh, uh, representative for Julian uh, Assange um, since there was a Julian Assange uh, case. And uh, Jen, um, I'd like to ask you, um, what, are, what are the impact for uh, this kind of revelation and for the original uh, collateral murder um, uh, revelation uh, inside the case as it now exists for extradition? Sure. Well, first, thank you, John, and thanks everyone for participating in this uh, seminar today. First, I want to talk a little bit about the collateral murder publication, just to give a little bit of context about why it is important in the context of the extradition case and, and the US indictment for Julian Assange. Because really for me, and this is a, when Collateral Murder was published, I wasn't yet representing Julian. It was before I became his lawyer. But as a lawyer working in the human rights and accountability space, uh, this video was striking for so many reasons. And for me, uh, the Collateral Murder publication epitomizes what I talk about when we talk about principled leaking and the importance of leaking, not just for free speech, but for human rights accountability. But also this publication and what's happening within Julian's case epitomizes the danger of the Assange indictment and what this means in terms of both the ability of the media to report on war crimes and human rights abuse, but also the ability of the human rights community to have access to this kind of information. And so first let's talk about the collateral murder publication. When we talk about collateral murder, we, um, everybody thinks of this video and, and the video is of course entitled collateral murder. But the publication itself for WikiLeaks uh, also involved associated documents, the Iraq rules of engagement. Those rules of engagement, which are the rules that the US military ought to comply by, uh, which were in place, WikiLeaks published those rules of engagement, which were published just before and after the video. Now, why was that important in terms of that publication? I think it's important to think back, and we've heard from Dean, the very powerful personal narrative of someone who knew these people, who were, these two journalists who were killed. Um, but we're talking about the killing of two journalists and civilians in the context of a conflict in circumstances where the military had refused to release, not only refused to release the video under freedom of information laws or at Reuters requests, but in response to an investigation about the killing, found that the US had complied with its own rules of engagement and it was not in breach of the laws of armed conflict. That was the context in which Chelsea Manning, the source for these publications, as she said in her own testimony before her case in the United States, went specifically to look for this video and for the rules of engagement. And I wanna read you what she said about that at the time. This is, from her this is her testimony from February, 2013. I saved a copy of the video on my workstation. I searched for it and found the rules of engagement. The rules of engagement annexes, a flowchart from the 2007 time period. I placed the video on rules for engagement on my personal laptop. I planned on providing this to the Reuters office in London to assist them in preventing events such as this in the future. I hope that the public would be as alarmed as me about the conduct of the aerial weapons team crew members. This is the context in which this material came to WikiLeaks and WikiLeaks published this specifically because the United States was lying about what happened to these journalists and to these civilians. And this was evidence of what commentators now unanimously say was a war crime. Now, I think it's really important to remember why that's important for the human rights community and what's happened to each of the people who have been involved in that release. Chelsea Manning spent years in prison and was subjected to um, uh, unlawful treatment, arbitrary and unlawful treatment. She's been in prison since because of the Trump administration for refusing to give further evidence in the WikiLeaks grand jury. Julian Assange faces life in prison. Those responsible have not been investigated. And now we're seeing sanctions from the Trump administration at the ICC to, to sanction those who are participating in accountability activities for crimes like these in Af Iraq and Afghanistan. Now, 
the, a lot of the media that you've heard this week, and this gets to your point, John, about how this how this release is important in the terms of the prosecution and extradition of Julian Assange. The indictment. There's been a lot of coverage this week about how the collateral murder video isn't mentioned in the indictment, and that's correct. But of course, if we talk about the collateral murder publication, both the video and the rules of engagement, a number of the counts of the superseding indictment, which I encourage people to read, absolutely cover the rules of engagement that were published by WikiLeaks alongside this video, without which we couldn't understand what was, of course, we have a very visceral human reaction to watching that video, but from a legal point of view, we couldn't understand the context of the United States lie about what had taken place in that video and the fact that they hadn't complied with their own rules of engagement had WikiLeaks not published those alongside the video. Now, the, the indictment itself covers obtaining, receiving and the willful communication of those rules of engagement. It, is, it relates to counts 1, 4, 8, 11 and 14. So to say that collateral murder is not part of the indictment and is not something that he's being sought for prosecution is not correct. The fact the video itself is not mentioned in the indictment, the, the publication is absolutely covered by the indictment. So we're looking at a situation where a journalist and an editor, as well as the source, are both being prosecuted for having released information that informed our understanding about war crimes. And that's why this is such an important part of the case against Julian. Jen, thank you very much. That was uh, absolutely crystal clear. So that's very useful to have that information out there. Um, uh, of course, if you want to know more about this campaign and about the campaign not to extradite Julian Assange, go to the Don't Extradite Assange campaign website or Facebook or Twitter, and there'll be a lot of that information that you can use uh, there. Now to my uh, final guest, and it's a great pleasure to have uh, Sami Ramadani here uh, to, to comment. Sami is from the group Iraqi Democrats. He's an academic in this country. He's uh, an exile from Saddam Hussein's uh, Iraq and an anti-war activist and I have to say if you want to know anything about Iraq or indeed about the politics of the wider Middle East you'd be uh, very well advised to make Sami Ramadani uh, your first uh, point of call. He's written extensively uh, in opposition to the Iraq, uh, to the Iraq uh, occupation and invasion and Sami I'd like to turn to you now and ask you um, what the collateral murder video has meant to Iraqis. Uh, thank you, John. Um, really, to say it in brief, it meant a great deal, not only at the personal, emotional level of uh, Iraqis in general uh, who were languishing under occupation, uh, but also within the context of the invasion and occupation of Iraq. I think it can be regarded as a seminal point, a, uh, a landmark, in attempts to expose US-led war crimes in Iraq. So it acquired immediately a significant historical uh, importance because up to then, uh, what Iraqis and their millions were telling the world that we are being bombed and killed and tortured and so on, um, went largely unreported. And when this video was released, somehow all that uh, attempt to cover up, if you like, US war crimes in Iraq started collapsing. I compare it to uh, uh, two events. One event, which was outside of Iraq, of, of course, and it was the Vietnam War, when Seymour Hersh released uh, evidence of the use of napalm against civilians in Vietnam during the Vietnam War. And one could uh, remember that horrific photo of the Vietnamese children uh, uh, fleeing, being, having been just uh, been napalm by, by US forces. Obviously, the Vietnam War was the big news, uh, and it was televised much more widely than the Iraq War was ever. Uh, televised in terms of the war crimes of the US forces, uh, but it, that was a seminal event. And then within the Iraq context, we had the WikiLeaks uh, uh, and the Julian Assange effort to release that video. And we had the release by US soldiers 
of the torture of Iraqi prisoners at Abu Ghraib prison. So as far as Iraq is concerned, these two exposures, the torture of Iraqi prisoners and the pictures that the US soldiers themselves released and the WikiLeaks uh, release uh, of the collateral murder video, uh, I think can be regarded as two very important events in terms of exposing war crimes in Iraq. And the Iraqi people owe a debt, a great debt to, to WikiLeaks and to Julian for, for, for what they did. I think Dean uh, described uh, partly, uh, I mean, and emotionally in a way, what the US were doing to journalists in Iraq as well. Uh, uh, John, there were tens, uh, if not scores of Iraqi journalists who were being killed, kidnapped, disappeared uh, uh, in Iraq during the war. And before the release of, the, uh, of this video, the question of the US deliberately targeting journalists in Iraq, whether foreign or Iraqi, was hidden. And in fact, the US uh, occup occupiers were accusing uh, Iraqi resistance and patriots of killing and kidnapping uh, journalists who were exposing war crimes in Iraq. Uh, totally obscene allegation. What was happening was the US so-called learned a lesson from the Vietnam War and tried to target journalists. And these two journalists who were killed as we saw in the collateral uh, uh, murder video, were symbolic of the tens of other scores of other journalists who were killed in Iraq, trying to do their duty, to do honestly their job. They were not the so-called embedded journalists. If you remember that phrase, the US uh, <laughs> embedding these uh, so-called journalists within their occupation forces. So, and I really do regard the current imprisonment of Julian as an act similar to the US occupation forces trying to silence journalists in Iraq, exposing their crimes. They have literally, in my view, in effect, kidnapped uh, Julian, put him in jail, punished him. Uh, uh, as the UN report showed, they have in effect tortured him. This is reflective of US and, uh, and British uh, authorities' attitude because Britain was also part of the occupation of Iraq and the, and the war crimes committed against the Iraqi people. What they are doing to Julian is sending also a message to all journalists in the world. If you expose our crimes, we will threaten you. We will do what we're doing to Julian to you. So it is of utmost importance that uh, people across the world, that journalists with a, a, an iota of conscience should be defending Julian, trying to, uh, the, to do their best to expose what's happening to him and to get him free. Releasing Julian from jail is an essential human rights act that must be upheld and supported by journalists all over the world. And I salute Julian again and tell him that we, we will be indebted to him. Sammy, thanks very much for that. Um, now we're gonna move into the Q&A part of the discussion now, but um, um, just, as, just as we do that, um, I want to, to uh, answer a couple of points that have already come up from people looking in. Uh, Drea Dri has asked the question, how is Assange doing? Is he getting to see his child and partner? And Carolyn Brain said, Stella Morris, that's Julian's partner, tells us that Mr. Assange now has a radio. It's a small but nevertheless important development for helping his well-being. Now, uh, th those, um, th those aspects aren't the, the, the subject of today's discussion, but they will be uh, the subject of uh, a major documentary um, going out on the 60 Minutes programme in Australia uh, this evening. And we will be um, providing a link to that documentary, which is about uh, Julian's relationship with his partner and his children, and about the way in which his imprisonment is, is endangering uh, his, uh, his family. And it will include Stella Morris's plea to Scott Morrison, the Australian Prime Minister, uh, to aid uh, the campaign for his release. So 
Um, that whole aspect of Julian's life at the moment will be the subject of that major documentary. And if you go to the DEA website or to the DEA Twitter feed or Facebook, you'll see the links to that uh, in the course of this evening and tomorrow and tomorrow morning. So uh, many of you, I'm sure, will want to, to look at that. But back to the subject of, uh, of today's uh, discussion. And I want to go back to Dean a moment because, Dean, I think... Uh, one of the most powerful things that's come out of your testimony um, and one of the most powerful things of what you had to say in your introduction uh, was the way in which you attempted to interact with the US military and when you were shown a kind of selected part of that, uh, of that uh, video. And I guess from their point of view, that was quite a clever thing to do uh, because what were they saying? You've seen it or you've seen part of it. And... Uh, and the fact that you said that you, you had to begin to think about whether or not this was the same video, um, quite a deliberately manipulative thing to do to a journalist, really, wouldn't you say? Well, I, I actually wonder if that whole thing was choreographed, to be, to be blunt, um, because I, I, I do wonder if it, was, if it was set up that way, right? Um, uh, no information is given before the briefing. No details are given before the briefing. Uh, arrive at the Republican Palace in, in the Green Zone, sit down, given a verbal account of what had been happening, shown some photographs, you know, taking some time. Then my, my colleague and I, we get into a debate with the, the two generals about the rules of engagement, about why, why on earth these two helicopters open fire on this group when, when, when there was no when, um, you know, about definitions of hostile intent and all this sort of thing. And, uh, and then right at the end, shown a small, a very small portion of this video. I, I just wonder how much um, thought went into that process because I went away from that briefing with those images etched into my head, in particular, the image of Namir peering around that corner. Uh, etched into my head and um, yeah that's I, I don't know what else I can say except I I long I, I wondered about that for years was was where we set up thanks Dean uh, Jen there's a, there's a question here from Corinne Henry which perhaps uh, you're best capable of, of dealing with it says um, shouldn't Julian be treated as a political prisoner by the UK uh, justice uh, system, um, shouldn't he? And what, what would that mean? Look, I do think that Julian ought to be considered a political prisoner if we think about the political nature of the offences for which he's being charged, which is part of the legal challenge in the extradition case. And I think this, this, this publication is a perfect example of that. This is someone who, who uh, Julian in his work and all of his mission statements about WikiLeaks has spoken about the need for truth and accountability. And that if uh, his great quote, um, which I often cite when I talk about his case is if he says, if lies can start a war, then perhaps the truth can stop them. And these releases, both collateral murder and, and the broader Iraq releases, as we heard from Sami was, and, and Kristen both were essential in um, the Iraqi parliament deciding to withdraw immunity from US troops. And so really, Julian set out with a with an aim in mind, which you know he talks about the goal, that the goal is justice, the method is transparency, and unfortunately we haven't seen justice for these um, crimes yet. But what we have seen is certainly a, a raising of awareness and, and the end of a war and an occupation because of what Julian did. Now this is the very material for which he's now in prison, faces life in prison in the United States for having taken the brave and principled decision to publish this material. So. Is it right that he be considered a political prisoner? I think so. Um, would that make his treatment any different in the British legal system is a completely separate question. So really, um, obviously we have ongoing concerns about his ongoing detention. We don't think that it's proportionate or necessary. Um, his bail application that was made by his extradition team what failed and, and we think unjustly, well, I think unjustly so. so I really hope that we'll see a change in approach and that uh, at some point you know, this challenge will be, will, will be successful because it is a dangerous, dangerous precedent, for, not just for 
for Julian and for WikiLeaks, but for journalists and editors everywhere, uh, that we see a, a source and, and the publisher being treated in the way that Julian's being treated. Thanks, Jen. And I should just correct myself. I said, I think I said that the, the um, 60 Minutes program will be airing tonight, but it's actually Sunday night and it's available globally. And of course, as I said, uh, we'll be providing links on the DEA website and uh, social media as well. Um, moving on, it's a question I want to ask both to Kristen and to, and to Sammy, but to you uh, first, uh, Kristen. Um, the collateral murder video was, was shocking. Um, partly because, although it was a single incident, people read it as being a, in some way typical of the way in which the occupation was being conducted by uh, US forces. How many other collateral murder videos do you think could have been made in that period? How widespread was that kind of uh, abuse of the rules of engagement? It was very widespread. and. Uh... The fact of the matter, of course, that uh, later in the year, in 2010, in October, uh, the, uh, the military field documents from uh, the US military from Iraq were released by WikiLeaks, the Iraq warlocks, which uh, in writing, uh, uh, you know, draw attention to uh, uh, similar events, uh, even involving the same sort of uh, uh, the crew that was involved in the collateral murder uh, uh, incident. Uh, the, the, with the call sign, a crazy horse. Uh, but other incidents of where the total callousness was seen in, in disregard for civilian life. Uh, and I want to mention actually that after the collateral murder release, we had uh, uh, US military personnel, uh, previous soldiers in Iraq actually stepping forward, uh, who have basically testified about how uh, there was no total disregard for civilian life. Uh, individuals like the, the, the brave former soldier Ethan McCord, who, uh, who uh, actually saved the children, wounded children from the minivan, uh, and their testimony was, was, was brought forth because of the collateral murder video. Um, it, uh, they testified that, that their commanders actually told them that if uh, there was an open fire somewhere, they should... Uh, uh, indiscriminately shoot 360 degrees and uh, and kill uh, anyone any, uh, without any regard whether it was a civilian woman or child. And the Iraq war logs uh, have so many examples of uh, of uh, cases where where women and children and uh, innocent civilians were shot at checkpoint because they didn't slow down too quickly before entering, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There is one there is one hurrying. Uh, report actually about uh, uh, an Apache helicopter that uh, that when you read it after seeing the collateral murder you can visualize it more. It was a, 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 an incident where uh, the gunship was uh, uh, attacking a truck full of uh, uh, men with arms and uh, the, the truck stopped and the, uh, the, uh, the men threw down their weapons and indicated surrender to the helicopter. And uh, you can read about this in a warlock. And the crew actually was not, uh, didn't know how to respond to that. Uh, there were no troops on the ground there. So they radioed back to headquarters and asked for um, instructions. And the reply came back that, well, we have to actually confer with the lawyers. And meanwhile, the, the Apache helicopter was hovering above with the, this man surrendering uh, below them. And after a while, uh, the reply came back. Uh, the lawyers have looked into this, uh, and you cannot technically surrender to an aircraft. So open fire. So when you when you when you read this account, and uh, after having seen the collateral murder video, you can just uh, visualize the uh, the horror and the total disregard for uh, for civilian life there. And. There's another incident that I want to uh, draw attention to here, which actually is connected to the collateral murder, but did not get uh, a, a lot of attention because it was not in the originally cut video. And maybe we can play that part a little later on. Uh, I, I stumbled across this when I was in Baghdad, uh, the, the, the story, because an old man came to me and started to talk about uh, the bombing of his house. And it took me a while to understand that this happened a couple of hours after the collateral murder incident. Uh, and he said, uh, uh, 
that uh, his wife and daughter had been killed and actually five people had been killed in that incident. And we actually have a video of that, which uh, uh, we don't know exactly the context what happened prior, but uh, on that video, you see the, from the helicopter video, you see the, uh, the crew observing two men with, with guns entering into a building. That was the old man's building. There were five families living in a building. And the decision is taken to, to send a, a hellfire missile and obliterate the entire building and killing five men inside. And one man actually, a pedestrian walking past the building. And I'll draw you, if we can play it in a, in a second, I, I, I want to draw your attention to the, the fact that uh, before they open fire on that house, uh, a civilian just walks, is walking past and they did not uh, uh, cease. They go ahead and uh, send the Hellfire missile straight into the, into the building. Uh, I hope you can watch this. Yeah, we're seeing it now, Kristen. Roger, I'll get you in constraint. Fire. I'm firing. Okay, let me just uh, come to Sami Ramadani now. I mean, I guess, to, uh, um, not to put words into Kristen's mouth, but I guess the, the summary version of that is that um, the collateral murder uh, video was indeed emblematic of the behavior mm -hmm. of uh, the American troops during the occupation. Um, is that your take, Sami? Yes, it's, um, it's emblematic, and its importance is that it... Uh, it blew the case uh, open for the world uh, to witness with evidence, with concrete evidence that was not allowed to, to appear. So it was one incident, and probably in the context of the immense crimes they committed against the Iraqi people, was a very small incident. But it was emblematic, it revealed the wider truth about what the Iraqi people were, we're saying, remember, uh, 13 years of sanctions from 1990 to 2003 uh, invasion and occupation of Iraq. Half a million Iraqi children were killed according to the United Nations. And Madeleine Albright, former US Secretary of State, uh, said that was a price worth paying. And then the war comes, the invasion comes, over a million Iraqis are killed. And this is uh, almost hidden from the world public. So it's an important, this, this WikiLeaks murder, uh, uh, collateral murder video is important because it reveals, it's a snapshot, a small little snapshot of the war they wanted to hide. And the war they wanted to hide was a war against the Iraqi people in general. They committed mass murder on a large scale. They used depleted uranium munition. It's still poisoning the land and waters of Iraq. The war hasn't finished. It's not history. The impact of what they did in Iraq is continuing. Depleted uranium. Secondly, the use of uh, other chemical weapons. Uh, they used white phosphorus on the people of Fallujah uh, when they bombarded that uh, city to crush it in 2004. And they denied using white phosphorus. I accused in an article in The Guardian directly the BBC of lying about that. Their journalist, Paul Wood, I named in The Guardian that he lied to the British public when he said white phosphorus was not used, that he attended, he was an embedded journalist then, he attended all the US commanders meetings on daily basis, witnessed all the battles in Fallujah, he did not see it. Okay, a year later, who revealed it? US soldiers. US soldiers revealed the use of white phosphorus in Fallujah. Iraqis were saying it, Iraqi doctors, they're saying, look, there is a chemical which penetrates the skin and goes to the bone, burning people alive. We've never seen anything like it. The media wouldn't report it. But once the soldiers revealed it, it became a worldwide 
event. So the WikiLeaks collateral murder video has this significance. It unmasks the veil they want to put on, on their crimes in Iraq. And their crimes uh, uh, are massive. Over a million Iraqis they, they killed in the process. And they want to punish Julian for what he did, exposing a little bit of that crime. And they want to teach all journalists a lesson. And this must be opposed. It must, he is definitely a political prisoner, in my opinion, because there is no reason whatsoever, even if they want to, to push the case for extradition, why, isn't, why is he in jail? Why isn't he allowed to go out, meet with his solicitors to defend himself? This is what political prison, uh, imprisonment looks like, is when they prevent you from defending yourself, from standing up and saying, look, this is what I did and this is what they want to do to me. In the United States, I might, they might even kill me there. And, and the release of the video of, of the death of uh, Floyd George is also falls within the same context that uh, police crimes or racist crimes and other crimes uh, by the state in the US is hidden from the public. Uh, and there are people, citizen journalists, if you like, who are exposing some of these crimes. And they are being targeted uh, uh, as well nowadays to prevent them from filming and so on. So the defense of Julian is to, def is to defend free speech, to defend his human rights, and we must uphold that. Uh, Dean, um, in, in terms of the impact of, of, of collateral murder, and I suppose of, of the work of WikiLeaks more generally, how do you think that shaped journalists' response to these, uh, uh, these kind of events? Are they more skeptical, more critical, uh, more aware that uh, that you know they might be played by the authorities than perhaps they would have been beforehand? Good question, John. Um, gosh, I, I honestly look. I, I I honestly, it's it's very hard for me to say because I, I stopped. Um, Iraq was my last active assignment. Uh, I then went into being a, an editor and, and actually most recently I was, I was trying to create a mental health and uh, wellbeing program at Reuters for three years before leaving Reuters. So I just can't say for sure, but I think uh, what, it, what it did show for journalists and, and what it should show for journalists is that you've got to question absolutely everything that, you, you, that, that governments tell you that uh, you, you, and, and you just need to scrutinize everything. And I think in this era, what, what shocks me, um, having been a journalist for 25 years, is just the willingness of governments to lie the way they do these days without any uh, regard for the truth whatsoever. And it, it's something that uh, I've, I've never come across this sort of thing before. And it, I think it's just, uh, it's horrifying. I Thanks. think it's equally following it. If, if I may sort of barge yeah. in, I think it's equally horrifying to me uh, uh, to, to see how many journalists are still uh, willing to be lied to. And that has to, has to stop. I mean, there has to be a learning curve. We've, uh, I, I started my career just a few weeks after uh, the, uh, uh, the beginning of the Gulf War. And we, uh, we, uh, then we, we had the incubator story and justifying the, uh, the, uh, the event there. We had had since all the lies, lies that, that, that took a few years to expose, many years, uh, but uh, it, it, it should be about time to that journalists actually uh, decide to, uh, that uh, the US military and the US government is not a credible source when it comes to their own action in, in, in wars and invasions. That should be pretty obvious. Indeed, and uh, I mean, many would say, I think that uh, during the COVID crisis, um, the extent of government lying has, has bled from foreign affairs into domestic affairs. And some of the figures for the scepticism which the general public now have towards the press are pretty, have been pretty shocking, released in the last, in the last week or so. Um, Jen, there's a, there's a direct uh, question uh, here uh, for you from uh, Conrad Zoe, and he says, um, it's quite simple really, um, what do you think 
uh, that the Australian government should do to support Julian and ultimately to bring him home? Look, we've been reaching out to the Australian government for almost a decade now on this case. What the Australian government needs to do is to exercise diplomatic protection over Julian as an Australian citizen. It is not enough for Scott Morrison to say, well, he's had just as much or more consular assistance than any other person, any other Australian. That is not what this case needs. This is a case of unprecedented nature. This is a case which threatens free speech around the world. An Australian faces life in prison for having published information, not just the collateral murder evidence of war crimes, but published information for which he's won the Walkley Award for Most Outstanding Contribution to Journalism, Australia's Pulitzer Prize, and the Sydney Peace Prize for what he's revealed about uh, the, the horrors of war. So this is not any other case. It is for the Australian government, and certainly the nature of our relationship with the United States is such that if we are such a great ally, then why can we not raise a question like this about the treatment of an Australian citizen? If the Australian government were to forcefully get involved and to raise this with Washington, then I believe the Australian government could definitely bring him home, but they have so far refused to do so. And it's up to the Australian public to ask questions of our representatives in Australia. What? Nothing will happen unless the electorate makes it happen. And I really hope that more Australians will start writing to their MPs and protesting about this Australian government's failure to, failure to act. Thanks, Jen. Uh, there's a question here from, from Boyce, uh, Boyce Franks. He says, democracy can only function with a free press. Is the real problem that the way our press is owned and controlled today, it's in the hands of too few, and the owners tend to fund par parties who end up in government? Um, well, it's a broad question, but Dean, what's your view of it? Oh, I think that's absolutely right. Um, you've only got to look at the, the corporate the corporatization of, of global media and um, and what chilling impact I think that has had on on many many media outlets. Uh, the ind independent press is shrinking. Uh, corporate media barons they cut, they slash, they burn. Private equity that owns media cut, slash, burn. And I think it's uh, it's just made journalism a very precarious occupation. Uh, and it's um, it's led to a lot of influence uh, being uh, sort of infiltrating into into newsrooms as well. And look at look at the look at the way the Murdoch press uh, presents news in its opinion pieces, its opinion pages, for example, as well. I think that's not that's not mainstream journalism at all. So I, I think there's a, there's there's a lot of big issues there. Mm. Kristen, it's an interesting moment as far as that's concerned, though, isn't it? Because, I mean, that, it's, a, it's a strong point about the general nature of the press. Uh, I guess that makes it all the more essential to, to get behind those journalists who do manage, and some do, uh, to kind of break through the wall and get the story out there. It's, it's extremely important, and uh, there are always uh, 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 brave journalists who are willing to take risks, as, there, as well as there are brave uh, whistleblowers uh, who are willing to take risks and, uh, and get the truth out. Uh, the, the fight for Julian Assange is about his life. I mean, he faces life imprisonment, and it's, uh, it's absolutely horrible to have uh, witnessed uh, how he has been treated in the last decade now, uh, uh, because I consider him a friend. But it is much more than a fight for Julian Assange uh, and his life. It is, in my opinion, uh, a fight for press, the future of the, the free press, uh, as was pointed out earlier. If, uh, if Julian Assange is extradited to the United States, it will be the most serious blow to press freedom in latter times, certainly in my lifetime. And I hate to think what happens if, if that goes ahead. It just, it, it will be total darkness. I mean, and, and so it's so important, not just for all journalists in the world to rally behind uh, this, this, this struggle to, uh, to fight against his extradition, uh, but every civilian that cares about uh, uh, the, uh, the health of democracy. There's a, there's a good question here, Sam. He says, um, how, can people, how, how can the people responsible for the war crimes evidenced in the collateral murder video uh, be held to account? Um, I mean, holding, holding U.S. troops to account in Iraq was always a near to impossible task, wasn't it? 
Absolutely. I mean, one of the things they did was make sure that they don't get held uh, to account in, uh, in Iraq. And one of the big things they do with uh, successive Iraqi governments since the occupation is put that red line condition that you do not touch Iraq, uh, U.S. personnel uh, troops uh, or contractors and so on. You do not pursue them uh, in Iraqi courts. You do not touch them. You, in fact, they even impose some conditions that you don't release Iraqis who might have targeted U.S. forces uh, because they jailed thousands of those uh, of those accusing them of all manner of. Uh, of uh, harming U.S. Uh, presence uh, in Iraq. So they put in enormous pressure, and they still do. Uh, to this day, Iraqi parliament only a uh, few months ago decided to ask the U.S. troops to leave Iraq, and they are refusing. They threatened to freeze Iraq's uh, billions of dollars worth of money uh, deposited in the uh, U.S. Federal Bank. They threaten militarily to hit uh, uh, Iraqi targets. They, uh, they, uh, they threaten specific Iraqi media, journalists, you name it, that they should not campaign uh, for the total uh, shutting down of U.S. bases in Iraq and asking their troops to leave. And to talk about Australia, really, Australia was one of the countries that joined in the, in the Iraq war and perhaps in not defending Julian or trying to at least uh, uh, give a hand to releasing him, the Australian government's also defending its track record uh, as a state and its involvement in the Iraq war. And that's unfortunate. Uh, but, but, you know, Julian is one of those very brave, uh, brave journalists along with, uh, with Pilger, uh, and others, and I'm sure Jen is also one of those brave Australians who want to contribute to unmasking, uh, unmasking these crimes. And the U.S. gets away with it uh, constantly. So to your answer to your question, we have a big problem worldwide. They commit all manner of crimes. They killed three million Vietnamese, according to McNamara, the ex uh, um, Defense Secretary of the United States. They killed three million Vietnamese, over a million Iraqis, um, uh, uh, Koreans, um, Lebanese, you name it, they've been at it. Uh, Libya, uh, supporting terrorist groups in, in, in Syria and so on. And they seem to be getting away literally constantly with murder because the way the world order is, is designed, is dominated by, by the United States, whether within the United Nations Congress, Security Council veto, and so on. So justice is not being done. And what do they do? They go and kidnap Julian uh, because he revealed some of their crimes. So that, it's a sad situation, but it is also truthful. And just one quick point about control of the media by corporations, very true. 80% of the British media is, is owned, uh, well, print media is owned by five individuals. How could that be called a democratic freedom of speech situation? These corporations control the media, but in itself is a reflection of the control of the corporations over the entire economy and our livelihoods in a sense. The big corporations control that and eventually they would control the media as well and they have done it. So there is, there is a complex uh, situation here which people have to become aware of that we are ruled by the big corporations and our uh, politicians are somehow listening more to the corporations than to the people and we have this disconnect and the state gradually just represents these big corporations trampling upon freedom of speech, upon media freedoms, etc. Okay, thanks very much, Sammy. Now we're right up against the clock here. We're nearly on the hour. So I just want to get my other three panelists to have a last word uh, on some of these on some of these issues. I want to come to you first, Jen. Um, it's often said about, especially about highly political court cases like this that uh, they're only partly decided, perhaps only half decided, by what happens in the courtroom. And I don't want to talk you 
get you to talk yourself out of a job. But um, uh, for the rest of us who uh, aren't lawyers, can't contribute in that way, setting the political framework, setting the political atmosphere in which a trial takes place is as important as what happens in the courtroom, isn't it? Look, I am a lawyer who believes that law must be seen in its context and, and, and that actually the political action of social movements does have a material impact on, on the way that political decisions are made about the law and certainly on raising public awareness. This case is and has always been incredibly political, whether we look at the fact that uh, the Trump administration decided to take this prosecution um, and the, the context in which they decided to, to indict Julian and to, and to seek his extradition. These are all political choices. The Australian government's failure to take action to protect Julian, that is a political choice. And so politics absolutely plays into this case. Um, and I think it's really important that people continue to raise awareness, continue to raise this with their members of parliament, continue to protest because we have to continually show that this is not okay and continually hold our government, the Australian government to account, the British government to account and the US government to account about what this case is about. Dean, um, it's been fantastic to hear your voice um, and, to, and to hear the issues that you've brought to this debate. Um, any thoughts about what you'd like to see going forward? Uh, well, look, I, I agree totally with what Kristen said. I, I think this, this is a critical moment in, in history, uh, this case, because what is at stake is, is, is government accountability and transparency, freedom of the press, freedom of whistleblowers to exercise, to, to use their conscience. And therefore, I would agree with what Jen said. I would urge Australians to get behind this campaign to bring Julian to Australia because so much is at stake. I, I just think we, we have to... It's just that important um, to, to do so. Kristen, um, the second part of the expedition hearing is due on the 7th of September. So we're not that far away now. What would be your request to people watching um, for what they can do about this? They have to become active in, in the campaign and do everything in their power to, uh, to support uh, uh, Julian. I mean, there are many ways to do that. I uh, urge him to, uh, to go to the uh, Defend uh, Assange website uh, and on the Exodus Assange website to get information of how to take part. I just want to make a final note on, on the duty of us journalists and, uh, and Julian, of course, as a, as a member of, of that community. Uh, we have a duty to uh, register history and uh, truthfully and uh, bear witness. Uh, we probably were not able to push forth uh, yet uh, the, uh, the uh, justice in the form of holding those uh, uh, accountable uh, uh, who committed the war crimes in Iraq. But there is a form of justice in getting the truth out and uh, and the Clara murder video and the other information that uh, was released by WikiLeaks is a form of justice for uh, Namir Nur al Din, for uh, Saeed Sma, for uh, uh, Salim Makassar Tomal, the, uh, the driver of the minivan, uh, his two children that I met in Baghdad, uh, Saeed and Doha, and his, his widow. Uh, it is the beginning. Uh, let's hope that we will live a time where those who commit uh, heinous crimes like this will be held accountable. And it is essential we get Julian Assange out of his situation uh, to his freedom to actually take part in that fight. Thank you very much. That was Christian Harvinson wrapping that up. Sami Ramadani, uh, Jen Robinson, Dean Yates, thank you all very much. You don't have to take my word for it. There have been hundreds of people watching. Uh, Ellis Walner said, excellent. Marco Penner said, thanks to all. You are real heroes. Two, it's a fantastic discussion, um, but it's not the end of the matter by any means. Uh, no matter how little you can do, do it. If it's sharing this on social media, do that. If you can donate money, please do send the DEA the money. We can make good use of it. If it's uh, campaigning by writing to your MP, you can go to the uh, DEA website and there's a, a pro forma, an automatic letter that you can just a couple of clicks and you will have lobbied your MP over this. There are 35,000 people who signed the petition online. Please do that. 
Uh, there is a model motion which my union, the National Union of Journalists, has passed and which is now going through trades councils and trade union branches all around the country. Please do use that. Go to your family, to your friends, to your workmates, to your trade union branch, to your church or your mosque and raise this question uh, with them. It's too important uh, to stay silent. Thank you all for watching and please do look out for future broadcasts from the Don't Extradite Assange campaign.